first of all, thank you for being here. And uh, it's so good to see you. It's been too long, but I think we've all been super, super busy. I just don't know what happens, um, but it's just crazy. So I, I'm glad you made the time. And I just wanted to, yeah, to have a, a first uh, yeah, time to, with us to, to talk about what's going on. And then also brainstorm. I don't want to bother you or bore you with my stuff. Um, but I uh, thought of putting a few slides together and then also, yeah, open up or to questions or thinking. What I'm realizing is that HPR has, uh, has completely neglected project management. It's just amazing. Um, how come they just, uh, talk about so many other topics and project management was something that, that yeah, they thought like many other leaders, uh, that it was something uh, unrelevant. And, and, uh, and the feedback is, um, is so good everywhere. So they're, they're surprised that uh, despite the word being project management uh, initially boring and not exciting, when we start talking about this, it's really at the center of what's going on, not just in organizations, but around the world. So. Um, just a, a, a funny examples, but if you look at, uh, I, I sent around uh, an invitation for a webinar that HPR organizes on the book next week. And I talked to the person in marketing HPR and said, in seven years I've been in HPR organizing webinars, we never had project management as a topic. Imagine seven years. <laughs> And they do once every month, so I don't know any chances then. And the second very interesting, hi Diana, Rosalia, good to see you. The second funny thing as well is, which is amazing, is you see when you try to register for the webinar, that you have a lot of roles like manager and then, but there's no project manager. <laughs> so I think we are opening a bit uh, the their eyes on these topics, I would like to brainstorm with you on how can we get this to the table more often and how can we, um, yeah, bring uh, project management to the table. Recently, I wrote about this saying that uh, I was following COP26 and then uh, for my personal um, role that I'm doing now in sustainability, but then I thought, how can you have 26 COPs with the most important leaders in the world? And we are doing worse in climate change than ever. So it's just uh, a lot of promises, a lot of things. And then what I think is that people like us, people like you should be on the table in these big gatherings like Davos and COP and I think we would make a better world if we can achieve that. So that's kind of my next dream to get us into the tables for big discussions around um, climate. But I see Mark, education, kids. Um, so I think this is where I would like to focus in the next two years. But anyway, I put a few slides together, but I really hate to bore you with my stuff. So I will make it super quickly. Uh, and then let's have a nice chat. Uh, it's so nice to see you all. So it's, uh, it's always, uh, I think always to call in more meetings, but then uh, it's just got so, so busy this year. It was impossible even to reply to mails. I, I just don't manage. Um, okay, so let me quickly share a bit of the most important concepts of the project uh, book that, um, that you know, so that's why I will skip that. It's all about what I call this project economy. I think this is the flipping part. This is where, um, what makes a big difference here is that um, operations, you all know that pro operations has been prime, no, in most of the organizations which are not project driven. Um, and with introduction of artificial intelligence robots, this piece shrinks. So the, this blue part is, is gone in a business and the people, who shift into project-based agile, uh, agile work. This I know personally because the people I was working in BMP 
uh, suddenly all started to work in agile teams and projects and product teams and and they, their day-to-day -day job disappear. So this is happening, for example, in banking. The big difference here is that in the past, project managers were people like us, maybe 5% in an organization. If you're project-based, that's different, almost 100%, but in a bank, in a telecom, in a pharma, retail. And the difference now is that all these people lose their jobs. So we're see, I think we're going to see 80% of the employees having a, uh, spending much more of their time uh, uh, project uh, work, agile teams, self-managed teams. So the structure that we had built before that will slowly or fast disappear. To make it this in, in a picture, I was talking in an interview recently, I say, uh, they tell me what's the difference with the gig economy? Um, and I said, well, the gig economy was external. The gig economy was, okay, we're having this project. Let's people bring consultants from the outside. They work together for nine months in the project. And then they dismantle and don't go to other projects around uh, the world in other companies. What I think is different now is that the gig economy happens within the organizations. So um, people will gather from different places and then dismantle and go to other part of the organization uh, and do that. And I know I see Steve on the call, so IBM probably worked like this for many years, but I, I, what I call this is the gig economy within uh, the organization. And that's what I think is very exciting. Um, I think you've seen this, but basically uh, we are going from a very stable world where the focus was on efficiency at the left, to a world driven by change, where it's more, it's project based, is is. But the thing which is very complicated is that, um, for being successful in the efficiency world, you needed all these elements in a certain manner. So, the culture, for example, the culture here uh, uh, was command and control. That's what we had, right? Command and control. Uh, but you cannot work in projects with command and control and discipline. It's, it's more about entrepreneurship and collaboration. Uh, yearly operating plans, this is a bit old. Now we're talking more about strategic, deep expertise, the marketing person, the finance person who spent 25 years in operations. Now we go to deep generalist. The CEO, this is a role that I, I'm writing about this. I think that role doesn't exist anymore. Now it should be killed. Um, uh, and now we'll see more chief transformation officer um, processes, the structure, the hierarchy versus the, uh, the more flatter organization. So this is very different, very diverse, very polarized. So uh, if you're a startup, you start on the right, right? That's no problem. Uh, Asian companies tend to be more on the right. So fast, agile, but established companies, they are struggling between where do we stay? And I think you need to keep the left side you still need to do it, but you need to shift towards the right. And that's where I think companies are struggling. So I'll just go quickly through this. The other thing that I've been talking a lot and created a lot of debate and some people got really upset. Uh, sometimes I, in the LinkedIn newsletter, I put the topic and some of them people are really aggressive. Sometimes I have to even... Uh, I feel like they're insulting. Uh, I don't know what's the frustration, but one of them was why project success continues to be so low. Uh, and you can look at Standish report, you can look at Bryline, you can look at uh, HBR or McKinsey, and the success rate is around 20, uh, 30, 35%. And I wonder how come we've been investing in, in certification. So, uh, and I, um, and if you look at digital transformations, the rates are 80% failure, right? So, uh, and they're using Agile and all these, but Agile is not solving the problem. So I just thought it would be good to uh, spend a bit of time into why, uh, why we keep to fail that. And I have my views uh, and we can comment. So I'm just going very quickly through this and then we can discuss any point you want. But if you uh, want to read, and there's uh, one of the newsletter was on this, and it just went crazy. And there's very good comments. There's good referencing where some people have researched the opposite. So uh, I just realized how 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 great is this LinkedIn uh, to <coughs> to learn from others, not just uh, share my thoughts. Uh, so I kind of provocatively say that there's very few industries that deliver 
that with such a poor success rate. So it's a bit provocative. And again, I'm not hitting on the project managers. I think the issue is bigger. But I say, imagine you work for a hospital and seven out of 10 patients die, right? And you say, well, that, that's is normal. Don't complain. It's, it's, the been, it's been always here. So yeah, you're going to be operated. You most likely die. But we are used to that. Or the same for planes, no? Seven out of 10 planes crashes and say, well, uh, we're used to that. It's the way it is. And if you're lucky, you survive. If not, you'd crash. And that's it. There will be other flights and more people to. So that's kind of, and I think for, and again, not to address, I think there's many elements that make project failure. And I don't say that these numbers are 100% precise. There's very few research uh, done precise on project failure. I think the one from Oxford, Ben uh, Fleawatt, uh, I think this well, also published in Harvard is one of the few ones that have been very, very methodical. Most of the others are just asking project managers their success rate. So anyway, but whatever the number is, I, see, I, I say if we, if we as a community say, okay, our goal for the next three, five years is to double success rate double, whatever it is, if it's 30 or 40, we double it. We're going to find out why, and we're going to change that, whatever it is, if it's the culture, if it's the leadership, whatever. And, and that is huge amount of revenues. It's, I just calculate based on the numbers I found, and it's just 14 trillion. It's like the GDP of China every year on value, whatever it is, if it's revenues or if it's impact. So I think there's no bigger way to make value than this is not more investment it's just doing it right okay Th three things i cover also very briefly they're part of i think you know the project canvas so what i did in this book i just simplified basically <coughs> for the non-professional project manager is the one you see in the right i got feedback from alex Osterveld who was in our call and if pignon so they told me well why do you have 14 boxes in a business model we have just nine how can a project be bigger than a business? So I work with them, we simplify. I still like more of the, the smaller one at the left. I feel more connected when you see risk management and procurement, the knowledge areas that we all learn. Uh, I, I'm just trying to see if this one will work with executives and, 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 and non-PMs, okay? So I think this one you know, but basically the, there was another big debate in LinkedIn, I say, this battle between Agile and, and Waterfall has been useless, has been damaging the profession. And, and I'm not saying we did that, uh, but it was there and we cannot deny. And in the comments, again, very people, wow, what amazing discussion, uh, aggressive sometimes. Um, and I think we should be promoting this. I think from PMI, from whoever say, you need hybrids, you need all these tools and embrace them in development. And, tools and competencies, so nothing new. Then you know about the triple constraints. I think we just need to build something around benefits and engagement. I talk about the Sydney Opera House where according to our KPIs, that was a disaster of a project delivered 10 years later and cost a hundred millions more and yet very successful. How come can we not say that in our KPIs? How come can we not say that uh, Sydney Opera House had some weaknesses. It was not well planned, probably, and but anyway, it was a great success. From a project management perspective, we should be able. So a lot around that and the engagement, the people side. So this is, I'm not sure this is going to look like that. I, probably you have also some thinking around this, but uh, I think I wanted to move the conversation from the inner kitchen for internal kitchen to the stakeholders. And this one is another example. It's a hospital in Brussels, which started in 2016, the construction uh, completion 2020. That was the goal for years. And they opened in 2018, two years in advance and say, how come this is a hospital? How can you two years in advance? Yes, well, it's very different planning. It's very much focused on benefits. And so part of the hospital was operational in two years. It's a mess for the 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 construction people and the project manager because it's not sequential it's you need to think about risks you need to think about healthy noise and all that but 
I just say there's no company in the world today that can wait four years to get benefits on any project. So we just need to change the way we think. That's why the, the bigger change would I think, again, this is just my thinking and you might have completely different views and I respect that, or you might add other things, but this is the way I, I think most of us learn project management with the project life cycle. I don't get into the discussions whether this is phases or processes. I see them more as phases or steps. I don't, there's some people who are extremely academic or passionate and say, well, in your pictures, you have processes or pre uh, I try to elevate a bit the discussion because that's what I care. I think there's merit on the other one, but it's not my field of expertise, so I don't go into that. But the project life cycle, I remember we never cover ideation, right? It's, we don't know about that. We start here in initiation, and then you do all the scoping, the charter, the planning, implementation, closing, kind of like that. We don't care what happens after. We say something about benefits, but we don't feel accountable. And then what I think is the new way of looking at projects is, is much more end-to-end -end. ideation. We should play a role in design thinking in knowing when an idea is ready to be a project, a bit on the prioritization. It makes more sense to prioritize ideas than projects because you've already invested a lot. So if we work on that spark, so <clears throat> I think we'll spend some time there. I do think um, on the part that we've done so far, uh, Gardner mentioned two years ago, 80% of that will be gone with artificial intelligence. I kind of agree with that. There's still a lot of chasing and, and reporting that I don't think why we will know that. And we still produce reports that are two weeks old. And, and uh, so I think that doesn't make sense. I think we've not embraced technology. Uh, most of the projects today are still managed with Microsoft Office uh, of a project, sorry, 40 years old software. So I'm working with uh, a professor in Canada uh, on a tool, artificial intelligence, on this space, on the prioritization. Um, so let's see if that brings something. I think we need to work on what's coming after. Why are we not accountable of delivering what happens after? If, uh, if we built an application, why don't we sell it? If we built a new organization, why don't we lead that? So just challenging a bit that handing over. And then the benefits, I think that's where uh, most of our focus in the profession should go. And to be provocative, always I say to the people, we don't want any project plans anymore with deliverables. We want project plans with goals, right? And when are we going to achieve these benefits? Um, and a new way that I introduced here on benefit in the book was we always did the deliver benefits. We think about the business case internally with the sponsor, maybe finance and a few very small team. What I propose in the book is, why don't you ask your stakeholders? Why don't you ask the people who are going to be impacted by the project? What do they expect from the project? So I created like a menu on benefits. And then you go to the marketing team, which benefits would you like from this one? You go to the HR, which benefits? So then you engage them already from the beginning. Most of the benefits they will want will be qualitative most of the time. Um, and the other good thing is that if nobody gives you benefits for your project, say, I'm not expecting it, that tells you that project is worthless, right? So you don't even need to start it. So I, anyway, and here is the method, the, the kind of the skills that I believe we need to build. So I talk about generalists, project managers, always seen as generalists, and with one method like project program portfolio or more the agile scrum and so on. <clears throat> and the narrow view. And what I see is the companies are looking for those persons who have all the tool sets um, and can use them and can delegate if needed, but mm -hmm. also that end-to-end -end view. So that's kind of, again, my views. Uh, when you look at Alibaba, Asian companies, this is a bit how they function. They're looking for people that can come up with an idea, find accountability of that idea, uh, they get funded for the first developments, just small. And if they see this works, they get a team, they get sponsors in from the board. Uh, and then once they're done with the development, they are accountable for sales, right? So I think that's where I think uh, it's the future, delivering the value. I, there's one thing that I also, there's with all this analysis and research, I come up with some things that now looking backwards, 
they are not making too much sense. For example, the thing I heard all the time, the sponsor is accountable of delivering the project. The project manager is responsible. So that I think put the project manager in a comfortable situation while you're not accountable of delivering the benefits. Um, another one, programs deliver benefits. Projects deliver on time, on budget. I think why, if a project is key, why should not that deliver benefits? So there have been a lot of things that I question and maybe not rightly all of them, but um, so what are the disruptions, end of job descriptions, the people working in the blue space that's been removed, going into project roles, no problem for us. The other big thing for me, which I think we're not yet there, at least from my point of view, is project managers, project leaders have hardly ever delivered um, real uh, revenues. If, let's talk project for profit based revenue say well i'm going to bring that much money um if your consultant is different again it's just in working in a big it's more about change it will happen in the long term and what i think today is the difference is that if operations are shrinking um and projects are growing i think we project managers will need to re bring revenue if your business is bringing 100 millions every year in revenues just on the sales and projects will need to bring half of that. And in the short term, not in three years, but which are the projects that are going to bring revenue? And I think that's a field that some project managers have, I think consultants, but many other projects, internal project managers don't have. And I think that's a big, and I say the PMO should bring you half of the revenues of your business and grow that. Not just reporting and methodologies and training, but bring me revenues. So I think, again, this is very um, my views, but uh, it's not water for all agile. I think the end of the CO, the end of the PMOs, as we know them in a matrix, doesn't make sense in a hierarchy. Resource planning, I think that that was great when you were working in a world which most of it was operations. People had an operation role and you could say, plan the shifts and so on. But resource planning mixed with what we have today it's, I think, impossible. <coughs> there will be other type of planning if you need for resources, but I spent many years trying to do resource planning with a PPM tool. It was a mess. And I think project managers move into implementation specialists. <coughs> and the last thing, just to uh, really leave time for us for to talk about this, <coughs> is what I realized, and I, I also like to hear your view, is that seen the pandemic as a big disaster which has been and, and human drama and, and and very very painful for many people i've been in the lucky side but anyway if you see i feel like there has been like a, a light uh, or a, a kind of a hey, guys there uh, you are you listening here is the formula to solve any problem that you have right and in this case, it was finding the vaccine. Um, and I come, I've been working vaccines. And if before the COVID, you would say, hey, I have a great idea. We're going to develop a vaccine in nine years, instead of 13, nine years. They would say, hey, are you crazy? They would put you in, in a crazy place because you, you, you say in nine years, that's impossible, right? And then suddenly we realized that it can be done in 10 months. So. What happened there? How is that possible that we did something impossible possible and something that was lasting 10 years is done in 10 months? So yeah, 10% of the time. So I think it's all about an amazing project, which used, I used the canvas just to illustrate, but anyway, there's a bigger purpose. It's about saving lives. <clears throat> and one thing that I see, which is crucial, and we don't have that with climate, we don't have that with education, we don't have that with poverty, is sense of urgency. That's the thing that I just, I think we can brainstorm. If we find a way to create sense of urgency, like it happened with COVID, we'll become rich and we'll solve all the problems. Um, so higher sense of urgency. What, it's very interesting, the CEOs of these companies, BioNTech, Moderna, Pfizer, they were dedicated 100% of their time in these projects. 
And I was in a podcast with HBR and the lady, the senior editor, Alison, tell me, I told her, well, I think to make project success, you need people to be uh, executives being involved, not one hour per month, right? Your future is your project. Why do you spend one hour per month, which is what most CEOs do? And she told me, interesting, I had an interview with the CEO of Pfizer a few weeks ago, and he told me he was working 100% on the project, which is something that he never did before, right? So it's, again, very much common sense, but we have the foreman. The other thing, 100% dedication of the best team. Uh, why most of the time it's just half of the team, how, who's available, 10%. So very flat structure, uh, very project driven. In the past, uh, companies, big companies will buy them. Mm -hmm. Pfizer would buy bon Moderna or BioNTech. And then let's wear. What they, we've realized is that doesn't work. M&A maybe works sometimes, but in this case of urgency, you want fast, quick. So what happens is they create an ecosystem. So you do what you do, you do what you do, but we partner and we work together. So it makes everything much flatter. Um, the he hybrid approach, they use agile, they use continuous improvement program, project prioritization, they use all what we're talking. And then what's interesting, also a big, big game changer is the regulators and the competitors collaborate, and especially these guys who are usually the ones who slow you down for everything here, they say, this is a massive urgency. So let's work together. Let's, let's give you some leeway. So again, this is very simplistic, but I do think that if we build this clearly and, and something I'm working on, but then input is or we can take any of these 17 goals. And I know Mark is on the call, so education, um, and you can solve that. If you use, apply the same concepts, if you apply the same criteria and you, you could solve them. We just don't have that sense of urgency. We don't have that alignment. We, we just, any of these calls miss what you see on the right. So maybe it's again, very idealistic. I'm very much dreaming, but I, I think this is the formula we fine tune, but we should be putting on the table on the United Nations, on COP27, which I think is in Egypt, Davos. Say, so guys, you want to really take care of this? This is how we need to do it. And with that, <coughs> I just want to stop it because I don't like to talk to you about this stuff that you already know. Um, and I will send you <coughs> the slides in case you want them. Um, I don't know how you want to run this. I think we are like a family and friends. So I would say, let's just raise your hand and comment, disagree, say I've done this before, whatever. Uh, don't talk about the book or so or anything, just about you and, and how we can take this forward. I don't think we need to break out in room groups, just uh, try to be a bit concise. And, and then we just... Um, Let's see how it goes. Okay, so I'll, I'll start from left to right. I don't know if it's the same left to right, but I have Philip first and Eric, Freddie and Mark. And again, don't ideas, thoughts, more than just talking about me. Philip. Hey, thank you, that, that was fascinating. Oh, sorry, I think it. <laughs> right. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, sorry, apologies about that. Uh, thank you so much. That, that was that was brilliant. And the, the book is is just wonderful. Um, I just want to pick up on a, a bit, possibly a bit uh, provocative here, uh, with regards to the rate of success of project management. Um, in the transition from the green box to the yellow box, if I can use that term, from the old 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 approach to the new. Um, the key issue is that um, there's a call there to be entrepreneurial. And if, if we're being entrepreneurial, then entrepreneurship is taking advantage of uncertainty. You know, that, that's, that's what startup entrepreneurs do. And if we then start thinking that, okay, well, project management, and you're talking about, we have to be revenue focused as well. If project management is equivalent to entrepreneurship, then when you start looking at the success of entrepreneurs, you know, only 20% at most 
are still there after five years or have achieved a successful exit. So 30% success of project management is good compared with entrepreneurs. I, I, I know, as I said, I'm being very, uh, very uh, provocative here. And also in terms of uncertainty, the definition of what constitutes success becomes very nebulous because what is success will change with the encounter with the enemy, for want of a better term, that when you actually get into the implementation phase, um, the world has moved on. And what you actually need to achieve could be very different from what you were doing at the ideation pro stage. So I would argue that ideation continues throughout the project. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. All. Um, and great points, Philippe. I'm not going to comment or argue. I just think you have a really good point. And if we uh, link in entrepreneurship to projects much more, then indeed success rate would be amazing, 30%. So good point. I said Eric next. Ah. <coughs> Hi, Eric. Thank you, Ryan. Ah, Hello. It's good to, good to hear you. And, and you. Um, I really uh, appreciate what you shared with us just now. Um, the synopsis is right on, on Mark. The, the things that I've been noticing are a little bit different. It's a little more nuanced. And what I, what I see about the cause for the failure is, is not necessarily what we know or what we can see and what we can do or what we think about. So I think the people on this call and the people that you're dealing with from a project uh, economy perspective are in the 21st century and thinking forward. What I, I think the challenge we have is the organizational structures we work within are still operating on 19th and 20th century organizational culture and structures. And I think we spend a lot of time trying to influence and, and make things happen within these organizations without addressing the culture and the organizational structure in which the work occurs. It's sort of like thinking about planting a tree and not preparing the soil first. You know, we are the tree and we're trying to, to make an impact um, and make the tree grow, but we haven't really prepared the soil. In other words, we haven't enabled the organization to accept some of the things that we're bringing to the table. So I think from an organizational culture perspective and an organizational competency perspective, I think we need to address the change that needs to happen in some of the organizations to enable the things that we bring to them to take root. So I see what I what I see about the transformation failures and the digital transformation failures is that they're seen as events. They're seen as a one-time thing rather than an organizational competency. So I think it's our role to bring the adaptability to an organization. Now, this is not something you do one time and then move on. This is something you build into an organization as a core competency so that when we bring new thinking and new ways of doing business and new ways of thinking about the future, AI and a whole bunch of other different competencies, the reduction of work, the distribution of work, the organization doesn't, doesn't resist, it actually flexes to those things. And I think it becomes incumbent on us to bring that competency forward in organizations we work within. So I, I would like to see us help prepare the ground a little bit better. And, and I think um, we spend a little more time there, we might be more successful. Thank you, Eric, really great point as well. And it's a challenge to change organizations, but definitely I think that's uh, one of, for me, the biggest areas to, to change together with senior leaders. Um, yeah, and I, and I think um, we haven't given, a, given ourselves enough time and enough effort to, to work in, in that space. And I think uh, yeah. it's something we need to add to our portfolio. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I go to Freddie and then Mark. Thank you, Antonio. Um, I, I was very delighted to see your book because, you know, it, it's making it relevant for today's uh, uh, well, because everybody starts, you know, making it as agile is good, project management is bad, right? I started yeah. from the world where there's no project management to project management being the best thing to 
project management being bad to agile being the better thing, right? That constant thing goes on. And as you say in your slide, the world needs both, right? And when I was working at one of the biggest publishers in the world, uh, John Wiley and Sons, which was publishing books for the PMI, we adopted the, the sort of the project management framework. And one of the challenges that I had was to, how do I map, map the project management processes and principles to an agile way of working? And I managed to do that at, at one organization and I take it everywhere that I go now. And I use it as a way to show relevance because there's a lot of people out there that is talking about stuff that they have no experience with, right? And unless many of us here who have been in that world where no project management, project management, and then now agile, and then you find that balance, then people understand that. So your book is so critical in my view in terms of repositioning project management relevance in this modern world. There is a place for it. And, and thank you so much for being the leader for making that happen because otherwise it makes it harder for the rest of us. Now I can say, hey, did you know about this book? Did you know about Antonio? And I use it as a way to open conversations. Now, continuing from there, one of the things that I do in the UK is that I'm a judge for the uh, IT, UK IT Awards, uh, uh, right? And that is the Oscars of the UK IT industry. And I judge in the IT project excellence category every year. Wow. Years. And I use that as my way to make sure that there is a relevance there. And you can see that all the great successes is the combination of both, not one or the other. Right. So I just want to share that. that and, and I do agree a lot with what Eric says. You know, just with Agile, it, it's a mindset. It changes from the culture, not from, you know, people telling you to do things. Because people who tell you to do things, usually they don't really know how because they've never done it themselves. Right. But we have a responsibility to educate the next generation, because many of them are so worried about being project management certified because they think it's a bad thing. And then they all want to be agile certified. Yeah. Right. So yeah. we have something to do here to make it work. Yeah. Thank you, Freddie. A great, great feedback. And I didn't know you've been so always here, the year project year of the great. Tell us more next time. Okay, Freddie. Thank you. I put the slides on the chat. PDF, if you need the PowerPoints, of course, happy to share with you. Uh, Mark, about the 2 billion kids project. That's it, huh? Uh, hi, Antonio. Uh, congratulations. This is really uh, terrific work and it's, it's really uh, pleasant to see. Uh, the key for me is the urgency part. And, and I think we need, I don't know how to do it, but we need a lot more uh, thinking on that part because there's nothing urgent except death. And that death is not even long-term because there's plenty of things. We say the planet may die. We may, we may uh, put ourselves out of, of sustainability, et cetera. Nobody really cares enough to do stuff. We can do it. We just don't do it. And somebody had a great line, which is that people are not truth-centric or anything else. They're comfort centric, comfort tropic, people go to comfort. So how do you, how do we move that sense of urgency? I think that's a huge problem because if we do, we can get there. And if we don't, it doesn't matter. We won't get there. Great. And that's what you're doing with your project and your soul. Uh, I'll bring up my, we are trying to, I want to reach 2 billion people. But the interesting thing is that we're going to fight before, long before we ever reach or, or affect 2 billion people. They're just going to be there to affect themselves eventually in the long term. So it's, it's, a, it's a real struggle to get people off their butts, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. And I think there is every point you raise here so far, it's a topic for this group to discuss, yeah. to deep dive and... What I'm thinking, I see Diana, Paula, and Alfonso. What I wanted to do is allow you to have a bit of conversation in small group to get to catch up. So if you don't mind, let me give you 10 minutes in breakout just to say hi and reconnect. And then I come back to you, Diana, Paula, Al Al Alfonso, just to comment. But it will be nice that you kind of go back to, um, to the community. And Elena, nice to see you. Elena from Andalusia. So I put a break up. Nice to see you. I put a break up just to catch up a bit with the people. We didn't have much time this year. So about 
eight minutes. So Antonio, first, it's uh, really wonderful to be back here. Yeah. Uh, and to all of you. Uh, I have been uh, watching the videos after the fact. Um, just a personal thing, I've uh, recently, about three months ago, uh, joined Facebook um, as project manager on Golo, is the learning ops um, with the focus on uh, product um, development or product launches. Um, so I've been a little bit busy with that learning curve and we're still working on our project. Um, but we really um, uh, are experiencing some of the things that you talked about, Antonio. Uh, and I look, uh, when we're looking at some vulnerability of the project, and I think it, it, it became um, increasingly obvious that we lost focus on the benefits. Mm -hmm. And that became obvious mm -hmm. when we got to the point where um, we could approach donors and we look at the messaging to the donors and we realized that um, without a full grasp of the benefits that we weren't able to communicate that effectively uh, in a way that would make someone want to invest in the project or donate to the cause. Um, in other words, we didn't have a specific demographics or a specific uh, a face or a profile of the people that we're trying to help. Um, so I think that that's uh, one of the things, and you mentioned that the focus on the benefits is really important. Um, uh, but also the, the, you know, failure can be the lack of diversity of mindset, skill set, and culture on the projects too. And then to make room for that diversity, the understanding that sometimes it can be uh, uncomfortable, but to recognize the benefits it and, and having that uh, type of diversity on the projects. Um, and so that's all that I really have to, to offer um, is that we are experiencing some vulnerability of our own projects because of, uh, I, I believe, lack of focus on the benefits. Thank you, Diana, and congratulations for joining uh, Facebook. We're curious to, to hear from that uh, one day and also about the project. So. I want to get a bit more structure for next year about this team. I think it has huge potential. So I just need to figure out the way that works for everybody and is not very heavy on, on, on the running. So, but uh, yeah, thank you, Diana and the team for you've been doing on, on, on that <clears throat> project that started uh, some time ago. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you too. Paula. Hi, Antonio. Hi, everyone. Wow, it's great to be back after after a little bit of time. Antonio, you've been really busy. This is a really great handbook. I, I really enjoyed the presentation, and I'm glad you shared the slides because they um, supported a lot of what I had thought in terms of, and have, I've been thinking for some time now, that our, our world is getting smaller in the sense that we're becoming more aware of that our, all of our needs are not being met and that we need to be able to look at them from a holistic and, and really a meta perspective of this world and not just and not just from a business perspective, but also from the end user perspective. And so whether it's regional or global, we need to be looking at all of these factors that the UN had put out to the sustainable development goals. Um, so I love the fact that you included that because I think that that's what will make projects more sustainable and more successful in the long run that benefits realization is not just for the company involved, but for the end user and the end users feel that they're consulted and included. Um, and essentially it's the end users who are going to determine whether you're successful in your project and your business pursuits anyway. So, um, so why not have a greater focus on making sure that their needs are met apart from your business needs. So um, yeah, I think that's all of that's brilliant. We had a really great conversation with, with everyone with, um, um, let me just, I had uh, a few notes here as well, with uh, Alfonso from Spain, Hermene Gildo from Luanda in Angola, Shrikanth from Bangalore in India. They all said the same thing, you know, the, the importance of sponsor and executive support, especially, you know, that was brought forth during this COVID time. But, but of, of course we need, it's, a, it's like a wake up call for all of us to, to work our projects in, in that um, you know, with that perspective, with, with, with that, um, that lesson learned that our sponsors and executive support need to be behind these projects. It's not just another incidental of the company. Yeah. They need to be more involved. So anyway, um, I, 
I really appreciate all of that. And I would like to also, you know, invite everyone. I'm just going to put a, a link in, in the, the chat and you're welcome to come to, to our TED circle tonight if you are free and en enjoy more intercultural um, conversations. Thank you very much, Paula. Great to see you and everyone. I see Susan has posted something on a new book. So let's make this also one of the topics in the uh, when it's about to come out so we can support you, Susan. Um, what I want, I see Alan, if you have a quick point and Alfonso, I know we're running a little bit late, but uh, <laughs> if you want to briefly comment, um, I'm happy to stay and those who can. Yep. Alan? Yeah, Alfonso. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. First of all, uh, thank you, uh, Antonio, for your great contribution to, to the project, our project work. And uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading your book. And one of the things that the discussions uh, we maintained with Paula and the rest of the team was about uh, the, uh, the main issue of uh, lack of support, lack of executive support in terms of uh, sponsorship, right? So even when executives uh, probably are aware or they are not aware about the, the need of project sponsorship in all the projects for being successful uh, because it was identi identified as the first uh, success, critical success factor, you know, for all the projects. That's crazy that, uh, you know, um, when you show the example of the vaccine development uh, was, you know, the, the fact that uh, the CIO was dedicating 100% of their time and it's one of the examples that uh, I, I will be using for sure in my classes at the university with uh, new project managers and, and students in order to, to get their buy-in from their executives because it is needed. So we were talking about that. And, you know, I observe when, when I am teaching in, at the university uh, that um, uh, students are living in organizations that, as you said before, are not really prepared for the 21st century changes and uh, complexity and uncertainty. So thank you. Thank you, Alfonso. And please support Alfonso with the research, if you can. Um, we've shared that already in mail. Alan, quick uh, comment. Yeah, I just briefly, you know, I, I wish I had this, your book uh, six years ago because I uh, tried to implement uh, a product economy type concept back um, when I had to set up a PMO at uh, one of our local companies. But the concept was, was very, you know, the project team work as a swarm, like a swarm of bees, and they move from project to project, implement, move out, you have a sponsor who's there to realize the benefits. But one of the issues we've had in that rollout was big resistance to measuring the benefits. Um, they didn't know how was one of the biggest uh, problems and barriers to it, especially when it came to the qualitative type of measures. So it's something I think worth exploring a bit more, maybe if we can make it more friendly for, for companies um, so they can e accept it easier and utilize the concepts. That might, I think that might help. Thank you. And I'm sorry we cannot go too deep in any of this topic. I just wanted to get together and I, I just see so much potential when we get together. It just, uh, it's just not a, been a priority, unfortunately, with all these things. But I do think that it's worth it to keep this going, even if it's every three weeks. I think we can be the group that puts this type of discussions on the big tables, on the big uh, forums. Uh, I, I can see it. We're global. We have the experience enough to say hey, we need to be in COP26 or 27. We need to be. So I, I just came to realize that this group can drive that. Uh, we can work together to, towards that. And, and uh, with our contacts, we could maybe make it. So I'm just thinking aloud, but anyway, I'll promise I'll be better project manager of this group. <laughs> I'll read my book. <laughs> you already are. <laughs> no. But uh, thank you very much for being there. And uh, I doubt we'll be managed to meet before, but I'll plan something really more regular next year. We'll plan it for the year and it's done. And, and then let's brainstorm. I think this is huge. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.